What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this video I'll share my favorite ways to compare dividend stocks. I'll also show you some metrics that indicate that the stock market might keep trending down in the short term, and will also explain why my plan is to keep holding and buying. Then I'll end this video with telling you the results of my hospital visit from a couple weeks ago. So if you appreciate content like this, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Okay, to kick things off, as you get into dividend investing, you need to learn how to compare dividend stocks to one another. Each stock you own plays a unique role that helps shape your overall portfolio. Some of your positions are better for stock appreciation, some have more yield now, some might hike their dividend more, some might give you a specific stock sector or industry coverage or whatever. Since I no longer have a job and dividends are what pay all my bills, I need to feel confident that my divvies are sustainable. I want them to come in from companies with long histories. I love owning quality companies that continually pay me some of their profits as an owner, and it never ceases to amaze me that I keep getting paid as I sleep, as I play video games, as I watch movies, whatever. And best of all, I don't have to deal with the toxic boss or work environment. Nearly one in five workers reports being miserable at work, according to Gallup's recent State of the Global Workplace in 2022. And 40% of workers wish that someone had warned them not to take their current job, per a 2022 Flex Job survey. The number one reason people quit their job is due to a toxic company culture, followed by a low salary, poor management, and a lack of work-life balance. But a silver lining of working in a tough job is that it motivates you to invest. Crappy jobs helped keep me motivated to invest for decades, and that also drove me to keep learning about dividends and investing. I really value my time, so I like to optimize things and figure out how to get the best returns with the minimal amount of effort. I'm a classic min-maxer for you gamers out there. So when I look at stocks, I first start at a high level and review a few things, and if those all look good, then I dig deeper. Let's use my dividend spreadsheet product to see what I mean, but you could always use Seeking Alpha or whatever websites you prefer. This is something I built called the Stock Comparison Tool, where you put in two stocks and it lets you visually compare them to one another. You can see that I put in Pepsi on the left and Coke on the right. Let's pretend I had no idea what Pepsi was, so the first thing I like to do is read a quick summary of what the company does, and here we see it says that Pepsi is in the manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of snack foods, beverages, and other products. Feel free to read the rest of the summary if you like. The summary gives me a high-level understanding of what Pepsi does. Now, when I invest in dividend stocks, I tend to like large cap companies, which means I'd like to see at least a 10 billion market cap. This tool tells us that Pepsi has a 255 billion market cap, and Coke is a 275 billion. Nice. We see analysts have Pepsi as a hold right now, but they have Coke as a moderate buy. Next is one of my favorite ways to compare dividend stocks, and that's based on how many consecutive years they've increased their dividend. My minimum bar is 10 years, though the more the better. In this case we see Pepsi is at an awesome 50 years, which they just hit in 2022, which makes them part of the Elite Dividend King group, and that's awesome. But that number is highlighted in yellow because the other side has an even higher number, and we see the Coke is at 60 consecutive years, so it's highlighted in green. Basically, this comparison tool highlights metrics in green on the better side, and yellow is on the worse side. Yellow doesn't mean bad though, it just means worse than the stock you're comparing it to. Let's stick into consecutive number of years a bit, because I see a lot of people making mistakes when they research it. Sometimes the consecutive number of years a website lists is wrong, because they use a too simplistic algorithm to report the answer. For example, look at BTI. Seeking Alpha says it only has three years of dividend growth. But I know that the company has increased their dividends for multiple decades. Let's try to understand the disparity by first digging into its dividend history. So each bar in this graph is another dividend they paid out. And just looking at this chart helps you see why an algorithm might say that they haven't been consistent in increasing their dividend. But a bunch of things are at play here. First, it's a British company, so they pay in pounds sterling, and due to currency conversion to dollars, the payout we get in America can actually go down year to year even though it went up in pounds, which is in fact part of what's happening here. So to really understand consecutive number of years of increases, you should be aware if it's a foreign company or not. And if so, then you need to dig deeper into their currency payouts, which you can usually find on the company's website. When we look at bat.com, we see that in November they paid out a quarterly dividend of 54.45 British pence, and paid the same in August and May, which is more than they paid in February when they did 53.9 pence, and as you quickly scan down the chart you can see a nice trend. But if we look at the American currency equivalent, we see they plan to pay 74 cents in Feb, which will change by the time we are actually in Feb, and they paid 64 cents in November, but 66 cents in August. 
So currency conversion made them pay out more in August than November, which would normally look like a cut, but it actually wasn't. It's just the dollar being too strong in relation to the British pound sterling. Another issue that you can see in the chart is that it has some taller lines, which means bigger payouts, but they are more spread apart, which means they were being paid less frequently, as opposed to the last few years on the right hand side of the chart, which were smaller payouts, but which were happening more frequently. What happened was that they were paying out twice a year, with one being an extra big payout, followed by a smaller payout, versus in the last few years they paid quarterly amounts that were the sameish amounts, but fluctuating due to currency conversions. So most dividend website algorithms don't compensate for all that, and they simply say, oops, this ticker only has a few years of consecutive dividend increases, which is kind of right depending on the lens you look at it from, i.e. in dollars or pounds or whatever. The key takeaway is that you need to dig into things on your own to understand all the various reasons why a dividend history could look weird. It might be helpful to Google the company name in the year a dividend trend looks wonky and try to find press releases explaining what happened. Another way algorithms can be fooled by a wonky dividend chart is when stock splits happen. For example, if a company does a two-for-one split, that means the market cap remains the same, but there are twice as many shares. So if you own 10 shares before the split, and each share was paying a dollar in dividends per share per year, then after the two-for-one split you would have 20 shares, with each one paying 50 cents per share per year. Your payout was $10 before the split and $10 after the split. But if you looked at its dividend trend chart, it might look like a dividend cut happened, when all that really happened was a split. A handy website you can use to check for splits is splithistory.com. And another reason the dividend can look off is if the company spins off part of its business. Like think of J&J. I had a subscriber named Hans who left the following comment on my video this week. He said, I wonder if J&J is going to lose king status when they spin off their health division. As a reminder, J&J is spinning off part of their company and is forming a new one called Kenview, which will be a $15 billion consumer health company. Kenview will include well-known brands including Neutrogena, Tylenol, Band-Aids, and others, and is set to be a publicly traded company by November of 2023. A big question is what will happen to the dividend and will they still remain a king? We don't know the answer for sure, but let's dig into the official dividend aristocrat methodology document to see how things might play out. Inside is a paragraph that says, For spinoffs occurring after January 1 of 2013, the yearly dividend increase history of the parent company is assigned to both the parent and spun-off company on the spun-off effective date. To determine annual dividend payments, the dividends of the parent and spun-off companies are combined until two full calendar year cycles of dividend payments are available for both post-spin-off companies. For evaluation purposes, the combined dividend amount is adjusted by the spin-off ratio. Subsequent dividend comparisons are based on the annual dividend amounts of each respective company. So let's unpack that for J&J, who has 60 consecutive years of dividend increases right now. When J&J spins off Kenview, my guess is that Kenview will pay a dividend and J&J will pay a dividend. For the first two years, as long as the combined dividend being paid by both companies keeps going up year over year, then my understanding is that both companies will get to keep the dividend and king's status. Then after two years, their consecutive year statuses remain intact if they individually kept increasing their dividend payouts relative to the amount each one paid in the previous year. For example, J&J pays out $4.52 per share per year right now. Let's say they spun off Kenview and J&J decided to pay $3 a year and Kenview pays $1.52 a year, thus the combined total is the same, even though it's now spread across two companies. And let's assume you got one share of Kenview for each share of J&J you had. Now as long as each company keeps increasing their dividend, then both remain kings. I think after two years then they are treated independently, as far as the methodology goes. Thus we're kind of now in a wait and see state until we get more info. Okay, enough on consecutive number of years, now let's move on to another key metric to look at, and that's yield. I usually like to see something between 2% and 7% for dividend yield as a guideline, not a rule. Like I'm long Microsoft, but it's under a 2% yield. Sometimes solid companies can have much higher yields, like I'm long Exxon, and it went over an 11% yield during the pandemic oil war. Remember, yield goes up when price goes down, and the amount they're paying out in dividends remains the same, or goes up. So when Exxon's stock price tanked, but they kept paying the same dividend, that made the yield skyrocket, and the brave souls who invested when the stock was so low managed to lock in an 11% yield. Anyways, in this case we see Pepsi in yellow at 2.48% yield right now, and Coke's a bit higher in green at 2.77%, but both are on the lower end of yields that I normally like to see. After yield is another important metric to look at and compare, and that's payout ratio. The dividend payout ratio is the fraction of net income a company pays to its stockholders in dividends. Think of it as the percentage of profits it pays out in dividends. 
You don't want that percentage to get too high, generally speaking, because you want to make sure your company has some breathing room beyond paying out all their profits as dividends. A low payout ratio can signal that a company is reinvesting the bulk of its earnings into expanding operations. I usually like to see something under 70%-ish, though in some industries like SIN stocks I'm okay with higher payout ratios because the business can handle it. And remember that REITs don't use the classic income payout ratio percentage and instead use FFO payout ratios. In this example we see Pepsi is at a 63% payout ratio versus Coke's which is getting a bit high at 75%, so something I'll watch a bit closer. If a payout ratio gets too high then a company can struggle to keep hiking their dividend unless they do unsustainable things like taking on debt to pay, which you don't want to see. Speaking of hiking dividends is the next metric I like to look at, which is Dividend Compound Annual Growth Rate, aka CAGR. Remember you have stock CAGR, which is how much the stock is appreciated year over year in an annualized amount, and then you have Dividend CAGR, which is how much the dividend has increased over time. We usually look at that CAGR over the last three years or five years, and then use that percentage as an estimate to predict how the dividend will grow going forward. In this case we see Pepsi has a nice 7.39% dividend CAGR, but Coke only has a 3.53% CAGR. That means Pepsi has been increasing their dividend year over year at an average increase of 7.39% every year. Generally speaking, the lower the yield, the higher the CAGR I want to see. And if a company has a super low yield, then a high CAGR won't necessarily move the needle that much. Also realize that CAGRs are based on what happened, they don't guarantee what will happen. But if earnings are going up, then I'd bet the dividend will probably go up as well. Now one of the things I sometimes do is add CAGR to its yield and come up with a number that I sometimes use to compare stocks against one another, and I like to see at least a 10% combined number. And in the past I've also done some permutations of that yield plus CAGR using various weighting percentages. Anyways, if we just add them, we see that Pepsi is at a 2.48% yield and a 7.39% dividend CAGR to get to 9.87%. Coke is at a 2.77% yield, and I'll add that to the 3.53% dividend CAGR to get a much lower 6.3% combined amount. And you can probably infer that the lower the stock price, the higher the yield, which means the higher the yield plus CAGR will be. Thus, when things are cheap, it's easier to hit that 10% plus combined mark that I like to see. Let's take a closer look at how dividend yield and dividend growth can impact a stock over time, so it really sinks in. Here's a chart I created that shows some of the stocks I'm long in, along with their current yield and dividend CAGRs, and how a $10,000 investment in each of them could grow over various periods of time. I created this data using my portfolio growth simulator tool in my spreadsheet product and it lets you put in portfolio values and yields and CAGRs and even amounts you want to invest in quarterly to ultimately get estimates of how a portfolio size and dividend income could grow over time if you are reinvesting your divs. So we see that Coke has a 2.77% yield, a 3.53% CAGR, which adds up to 6.3%, which is below my 10% bar. In this case, a $10,000 investment into Coke would get you $277 in dividends in the first year. By year 10, if you were reinvesting your dividends and they kept hiking their dividend by 3.53% per year, then you would be at $379 of Coke dividends a year. By year 20, your Coke investment would be yielding $535 in divvies a year, then $758 in year 30, and $1,072 by year 40. Obviously, the further you go out in time, the less likely that the estimates will be accurate, and this doesn't account for inflation or taxes. Now let's compare Coke's numbers to Pepsi's. We see Pepsi has a slightly lower starting yield at 2.48%, but it has a much higher dividend CAGR at 7.39%. So year one we see Pepsi makes less in divvies than Coke due to Pepsi's lower starting yield, but by year 10 we see Pepsi would be making $471 a year as compared to Coke at $379. And if we jump way ahead to year 40, we see Pepsi's CAGR has really pushed the income generation and it's making $4,000 a year as compared to Coke at 1,072, so Pepsi's high CAGR has pushed it to make four times the amount of income as Coke when we go four decades out. Or look at something like Realty Income Ticker O that has a higher starting yield at 4.72%, but a lower CAGR than Pepsi's at 3.93%. In O's case, we see that at year 20 its income is at $982 a year, which beats out Pepsi which is at $961 a year, but then from that point on Pepsi pulls forward. Now look at Home Depot, which has a lower starting yield at 2.35%, but a huge CAGR at 16.38%. Its yield and CAGR are high enough that by year 10 it's already producing more income than any of the others. Or AbbVie is an even bigger outlier, with its 3.67% starting yield, coupled with its ridiculous 20.93% CAGR. It wins at all time frames. But there's no such thing as a perfect investment, and everything has risks. Like AbbVie has been doing really well since it owns Humira, which is the world's best selling drug, but now that competing drugs can take its place due to patent issues, well AbbVie's growth will most likely slow down, which means its hikes will be smaller, thus this kind of estimated growth in this chart is probably unrealistic. 
Regardless, hopefully this chart helps you see how yield, CAGR, buying price, etc. are all things you want to use when you're comparing dividend stocks. A company with a high dividend CAGR is unlikely to keep hiking at large amounts for decades, and you should be able to see how a higher starting yield helps your income now, whereas a higher dividend growth rate helps your income down the road. Buying stuff when it's on sale is important, because otherwise you are significantly stunting your dividend income potential and ultimately your returns. And of course you probably care about stock appreciation as well, and in this chart I didn't show portfolio values and I assumed a 1.75% quarterly increase in share prices. Anyways, hopefully you can also see how yield plus CAGR gives you some insights into how a company might perform over time, and why a high combined number like over 10 or 12% is awesome, though a too high of a number like Home Depot's and Abbey's probably won't be sustainable. I started investing in the 90s and I was adding yield to CAGRs for years as part of my analysis before I found out that other people were doing similar things. Like there's a guy named Chowder who posts on Seeking Alpha who came up with some rules around adding yield to CAGR that you should be aware of. Seeking Alpha didn't come into existence until 2004, and then Chowder started posting articles on it in 2014, though he was commenting on other articles before that. Anyways, this is what he came up with. Rule number one. If a stock has a dividend yield greater than 3%, its Chowder number must be greater than 12%. Chowder number is what he called yield plus CAGR. So from our chart, the only stock which passes his rule number one right now is AbbVie. His rule number two says that if a stock has a dividend yield less than 3%, its chowder number must be greater than 15%. So in this case, Home Depot passes that test. Rule number three, if a stock is a utility, its five-year dividend growth rate plus its dividend yield must be greater than 8%. I don't have any utilities on this chart, but his special utility rule was created since utilities tend to have more stable and predictable earnings due to their regulated and monopolistic nature, so a lower yield in CAGR makes sense. Chowder's rules are basically saying that the higher the yield, the lower the CAGR he's okay with, i.e. yield greater than 3, its CAGR must be greater than 9. If its yield's less than 3, then its CAGR must be greater than 12%. So the rules help identify candidates for investment. Of course, even with the Chowder rules, you still want to make sure it's a quality company, so you still need to evaluate its financial trends, its moats, if its dividend is sustainable, if the company has too much debt, etc. He originally thought that an 8% Chowder number was what he wanted to see, but later he drove that up to 12%, though he had his utility carve out. I'm usually okay with the 10% yield plus CAGR, and that's one of the things I look for when I'm evaluating potential investments. It's hard to find things that are both high yield and high CAGR, though once in a blue moon you can find them, though it can also be a red flag if you see it too high of a score. Companies that have a high yield plus CAGR number tend to outperform the index both in income and total returns, which is nice. Okay, let's go back to looking at Pepsi and Coke. Another way I like to compare stocks is to look at their stock price trends over a long period of time. Here we see both stock prices have trended up, though Pepsi has gone up a bit faster. If I scroll down we can compare dividend payouts, and we see Pepsi's dividend has grown slightly faster than Coke's, which is what you'd assume given Pepsi's dividend CAGR was higher over the last few years. And I also like to look at yield trends over time when I'm comparing stocks. We see that Pepsi's has trended pretty flat overall, which basically means that over the years as Pepsi's stock prices trended up, they increased their dividend by a similar percentage to keep the yield relatively the same. Coke, on the other hand, has a slightly decreasing yield trend, which means they weren't raising their dividend quite as fast as their stock price went up, and which some investors look at as meaning it's not as compelling to buy, as they'd rather want to buy in when the yield was higher relative to its longer term average, as that would often imply the price was probably lower. Moving on, I also like to look at how EPS has trended, and it's pretty easy to see visually that Pepsi's EPS has been growing better than Coke's. Another helpful comparison metric is how shares outstanding have trended, and you usually want to see that number going down. So here you can see that Pepsi is more aggressively buying back shares relative to what Coke is doing, and thus Pepsi is driving their outstanding share count down faster, which I like because that means that each of my shares is now owning a larger portion of the remaining company. I also like to look at how assets and liabilities have trended over time, and I like to make sure that liabilities aren't more than assets and aren't growing faster over extended periods of time. In this case they both look fine, but I do see liabilities growing a tad faster than assets, so something I'll watch. And again Pepsi's trends look a bit nicer than Coke's, since Coke's liabilities are growing a bit faster in relation to its assets. Moving on we come to an important metric and that's revenue trends, and you can see Pepsi's has a nicer trend line, and Coke's is a bit disconcerting as it's flat and somewhat down, so something to watch over time. Then after revenue I like to look at net income trends, and again we see Pepsi's growing a bit, but Coke's profit trend looks less compelling. After that, another important metric to look at and compare is debt. Here we can see both debt piles are growing, though Coke's is growing a bit faster, so not as good. 
And then we come to price to free cash flow ratios, which is a valuation metric that indicates a company's ability to continue operating and is calculated by dividing its market cap by its free cash flow values. And just like the PE ratio, a value of less than 15 to 20 is generally considered good. The price to free cash flow ratio measures how much cash a company generates relative to its stock price rather than what it records in earnings relative to its stock price, aka the PE. Anyways, in this video I've touched on some key metrics, but I'd normally dig deeper by doing things like discounted cash flows to value prices, and I'd review more of the cash flow statement and income statement and blah blah blah, but hopefully you get a flavor of some of my favorite ways to compare dividend stocks. Of course, I'd also make sure that the stock I was considering fits in my portfolio vision, and that it has a strong management team, and that I understood its competitive landscape, and all that other stuff I did in those long analysis videos I released when I first started my channel years ago. Anyways, I bet you can now see why I think Pepsi is often a better investment than Coke, generally speaking, even though my taste buds prefer Coke. And bottom line, I like them both enough that I'm long both. Okay, I hope that helped. Now I'll move on and show you some metrics that would normally indicate that the stock market should continue to trend down for a while. Now, some people might think the Fed is pivoting and that the market should jump back up. By pivot, I'm talking about no longer raising interest rates. The lower interest rates go, the cheaper it is to borrow money, which in turn acts as a catalyst for businesses to buy and spend more, which then tends to push the economy up. The problem is that when we look at the last three bear markets, i.e. the pandemic, the 2009 financial crisis, and the 2001 dot-com bubble, we see that it respectively took anywhere from about 250 to 650 days after the Fed started lowering rates for the SP500 to bottom. And the Fed hasn't even started lowering rates yet. So if history is our guide, then we could be multiple years away from the SP500 bottoming, Though again, it's the market, so while some experts are guaranteeing a recession in 2023, I also wouldn't be surprised if the market trended up. Okay, another metric that's flashing a warning sign is the S&P Schiller PE, aka the Cyclically Adjusted Price to Earnings Ratio, or CAPE Ratio. The CAPE Ratio is used to analyze publicly held companies' long-term financial performance while considering the impact of different economic cycles on company earnings. So it's a valuation measure that uses EPS over a 10-year period to smooth out fluctuations in corporate profits that occur over different periods of a business cycle. Remember, P.E. ratios are calculated by dividing a company's stock price by its earnings per share. In other words, the P.E. ratio shows what the market is willing to pay for a stock based on its current earnings and is one of the most widely used valuation metrics for stocks. The P.E. ratio of the S&P 500 divides the index by the reported earnings over the trailing 12 months. In 2009, when earnings fell close to zero, well, the classic P.E. ratio wasn't too useful. What often happens is we have a recession, stocks fall, and corporate earnings can fall even more, which can then temporarily raise the P.E. ratio. Since we normally want to buy when the P.E. is low, this high P.E. might fool some people into thinking that the market is expensive when it's really not. So Robert Schiller, a professor of economics at Yale and a Nobel laureate, made a new version of the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio to help smooth the P.E. ratio out and show a more accurate representation of the ratio between current earnings and prices. The way it works is that you take the average of the last 10 years of earnings, adjust them for inflation, and divide the current index price by that adjusted earnings. This makes it so that the current price is divided by the average earnings of the latest business cycle rather than just one recent year of bad or good earnings. And in all five instances where the S.P. Schiller P.E. has crossed above 30 during a bull market rally since 1870, that eventually resulted in a decline of at least 20% for the S.P. 500. A couple months ago, the Schiller P.E. was over 30, and right now it's around 29, so all that is pointing to more down markets. Another warning sign is the S.P. 500's forward P.E. With the exception of the Great Recession, the S.P. 500 hit its low point with a forward P.E. of 13 to 14 numerous times since 1995, but the forward P.E. is around 19 right now, which means it's saying more market downside is coming. And another metric that's flashing a warning sign is margin debt. That's the amount of money investors have borrowed from their broker, with interest, to buy or short sell stocks. Over time, it's normal for the amount of outstanding margin debt to increase as the overall value of the stock market increases. What isn't normal is when the amount of outstanding margin debt skyrockets over a short time frame. Motley Fool is saying that since the beginning of 1995, there have been three instances where margin debt surged 60% or more on a trailing 12-month basis. This happened immediately prior to the dot-com bubble bursting, just months before the financial crisis took shape, and in March of last year. So I'll share more from Motley Fool that said that upward percentage spikes in margin debt have preceded three of the past four bear markets, with the one-month pandemic crash being the exception. Not only has outstanding margin debt been a good predictor of an eventual bear market, but it's done a good job of forecasting bear market bottoms. When the dot-com bubble and financial crisis eventually hit bottom, trailing 12-month declines in margin debt ranged between 40 and 
Current declines in margin of debt are only down a little over 20%, which one might interpret as saying that we'd need to see an additional unwinding of margin-based positions before a true market bottom is in place. For more context, the SP500 subsequently lost 49% and 57% of its respective value, the previous two times margin debt skyrocketed by 6% or more in a 12-month stretch. But the SP500 is only down 26% from peak this year. I know 26% sounds like a lot, but it's not if we're thinking it could fall on another 26%. Anyways, there are other warning signs flashing right now, like yield curve inversions, high inflation, disappointing earnings, unemployment rising, more geopolitical events, crypto crashes, oil supplies, supply chain issues, blah blah blah. So why don't I sell? I mean, with all these warnings, why am I not selling everything and taking a cruise to the Bahamas until everything is hunky-dory? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. One is according to data by Yardeni Research, there have been 39 separate declines of at least 10% in the SP500 since the beginning of 1950. But every single one of those crashes, corrections, and bear markets were eventually destroyed by a bull market rally. In fact, Bank of America just said that our 10-year evaluation model suggests that even if you buy today, you will enjoy roughly 5% returns, pushing the SP500 to 6,000 by 2032. Look, no one can predict what will happen, so I just keep moseying along, enjoying the marathon, and not treating it like a sprint. Remember, time in the market beats timing the market. A study by Crestmont Research found that an investor would have hypothetically purchased the SP500 index at any point from 1900 onwards and held that position for at least 20 years, they would have generated a positive total return, including dividends paid, every single time. Specifically, they found that the rolling 20-year total returns averaged 10.9% or higher on an annual basis in more than 40% of the years from 1919 to 2021. In other words, even though things might look shaky right now, I believe that people who invest for the long term in quality companies will do fine, whether they invest now, tomorrow, or whenever. Sure, you want to buy when things are cheap, and sure the market can be crap for a decade or more, but that's part of the game and you don't want to be spooked out. I don't liquidate my dividend portfolio because I believe that over time, good companies will earn more, which means stock prices will probably trend up, and so will my divvies. Plus, I know how difficult it is to jump back into the market once you sell out. Too many people try to time the market and they usually lose. My strategy of buying and holding, statistically speaking, tends to outperform people who constantly buy and sell. I feel confident enough in my dividend portfolio that even if the markets keep trending down, I believe my dividend income will keep flowing in. Besides, so far my portfolio has held up really nicely in this market. I mean, right now I'm down only about 2% from my all-time portfolio peak, and that's even with me spending the majority of my dividends to pay bills. Had I not been spending them, then I'd be at a new all-time portfolio high right now. I guess conservative blue chip dividend stocks are doing better than the overall market, which makes sense that defensive companies are down less on average. Regardless of market movement, I plan to keep holding what I have, and I'll keep dripping my retirement account dividends into realty income or something else. I'd actually prefer if the market crashes more so that I can acquire realty income shares faster. Of course, if you ask me to guess what I think will happen, then a big recession seems plausible. But things could also go sideways or up, and either way, it historically hasn't impacted my dividends too much, and I think my companies will survive in pretty much any economic climate. Moving on, now I want to end this by telling you the results of my hospital visit from a couple weeks ago. For those of you that watched my video called My Worst Investing Mistakes, I told you how I recently went into the hospital to do a routine colonoscopy and how they found a couple polyps. Well, good news, they came back benign, and to be safe, they recommended they get another colonoscopy in 5 years rather than the normal 10. So if you're 45 or older, then I strongly recommend you talk to your doctor about getting a colonoscopy. It might literally save your life, and if you want to enjoy dividends as you get really old, then also take care of looking into your health with preventative stuff like a colonoscopy. And on that note, I'd like to shout out people who have recently signed up to support my work of educating the world to dividends. I'll start with thanking my newest dividend Discord boosters. So thanks B45710N, and thanks Lazy Lexi. Next, I'd like to shout out my newest Patreon aristocrats who signed up since my last video. So thank yous go out to TJH0123, Matthew H, 16 Labyrinths, Hans F, Mafiel, and Shawnees. I'd also like to thank Late to the Game, who signed up for an entire year to get the 10% discount. And finally, thank you Kingsteak, who also signed up for an entire year. If you're interested in supporting my work to educate the world about dividend investing, then go to patreon.com, search for Gen X Dividend Investor, and then sign up if I have any open seats of the tier you want. I tend to sell out seats quickly when I open them up, and I limit access due to the support I provide and the time it takes me to onboard new people. Aristocrats gain access to my dividend portfolio tracker spreadsheet, which I use in lots of my videos, and they get special access to various private channels on my Discord, including one which lets you watch my videos before I release them publicly on YouTube, as well as lets you vote on which thumbnails I should use, and of course you get more direct access to me. 
They also get a shout out as you just heard, and I add them to my swirling news stickers on my videos. Kings get everything aristocrats get, plus we can do a monthly 30 minute private voice chat to talk about whatever you want. Finally, I urge everyone to join my free dividend discord chat server, which has thousands of dividend investors on it from around the world. Regardless of what you do, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.